Finally, in front of the Judiciary Committee is HB 1543 relative to the Citizens' Petition for Redress of Grievances by the Legislature. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. For the record, I'm Representative Dan Insa. I represent Rockingham County District 9, at the end of Fremont. I have submitted House Bill 1543 because, again, I have been studying the Constitution and the history of the state. First of all, I want to provide this to the committee. This is legislative research done about three years ago. Uh, by Richard Lambert, which gives you a brief history of the practice of uh, petitioning for the redress of grievance in the state of New Hampshire. Um, it was um, at the found, well, first of all, let's look at Article 31, which is stated for you here. The legislature shall assemble for the redress of public grievances and for the making of such laws as the public good may require. And then Article 2. The people have a right in an orderly and peaceful manner to assemble and consult upon the common good, give instructions to their representatives, and to request of the legislative body by way of petition or remonstrance, redress of the wrongs done them, done them and the grievances they suffer. Now this was interpreted for the first 35 years of our state, uh, 1784, uh, sure, in the, the formative years prior to that, during the war, through uh, 1819 that any individual citizen, if they were wronged by government, could uh, have a legislator write up a petition on their behalf and come before the legislature to uh, speak before the legislature. And I have in support of that um, a number of, uh, here we go, uh, the uh, journal from uh, uh, 1791, which has, which lists a number of petitions for redress of grievance. I have actually a complete redress of grievance. Uh, it's an act to restore Elizabeth McClary to her law. Uh, what happened was Elizabeth McClary had gone to England, and while she was in England, uh, a relative died, and. In her absence, the probate was heard, and when she came back, she found she had no estate. And she petitioned the court to be restored to her law. And uh, she petitioned the general court to be restored to her law, and they agreed that, that uh, the hearing, a new probate hearing should be had. Uh, and fortunately, the person who had received the estate also agreed. They heard, reheard the case, and she was restored her estate was restored to her. Um, I also have uh, the, the uh, laws of our state progressively through the, through the years, uh, 1842, 1867, 1921, and 1925, which uh, deal with the due process of somebody who is a party to regressive grievances. That is, uh, somebody's petition uh, they're they're the on the receiving end of somebody's petition, whether it's an individual or some entity, and how are they how they are to be notified of the petition so that they can come and defend themselves before the general court. Uh, this was last in our laws in 1925, and then in the next uh, uh, recodification it was simply dropped. It was not incorporated. It, it wasn't that it was removed. There, were, there was no bill introduced to, to remove these, these uh, issues of due process. Uh, there was no public hearings. It was simply in the recodification. To be generous, they forgot. And so the due process uh, regarding redress of grievances disappeared from our statutes. However, there was still the capacity for redress of grievances, and I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Meavers, our, our state archivist, will come and testify as well. He had, he had said he would. He's been compiling uh, petitions for the redress of grievances from the beginning of our state and is up into the early 1800s. Um, it was a very active, uh, it was the primary business of the legislature to hear these redresses of grievances. 
And you, you might say, well, why is that important? What, what's the difference between a petition for a redress of grievance and a constituent bill? There's a big difference. When we hear a bill, we're hearing the solution to a problem. And very often we judge merely on whether or not this bill is a, an adequate solution to a problem. But never do we hear the litany of problems that would initiate a bill. And so we are, we, are, we are in the situation of hearing solutions that may not, and often do not, address the problem. If we can hear the redress of grievances, we hear the problem. And that leaves it up to us to craft and what we believe to be the appropriate solution a different way of doing business, but it is actually the way of business that we were designed for. Um, now, the people still had the capacity to introduce petitions for the redress of grievances until 1963. But what happened in 19, prior to 1963, we all drafted our own legislation, bills, resolves, petitions. That was what our, our job. We, we wrote them out and we handed them to the clerk. However, in 1963, we created legislative services. And we no longer have the ability to directly introduce legislation to the general court. Unfortunately, when we created le legislative services, the statute is written for them to draft bills and resolutions. Last uh, session, I attempted to introduce a redress of grievance. Of course, I went to the clerk, and the clerk said, well, you can't come to me. You have to go to legislative services. I went to legislative services, and they said, well, you can't come to us because you haven't given us the authority to draft petitions for the redress of grievance. And so despite the fact that we have this uh, positive right, one of the few positive rights in our Constitution, uh, not a, not a uh, uh, protection that the government can't do something, but a positive right that the people can do something. The people do not have the mechanism to be heard. And to, to put it in vernacular, you can't get there from here. If the person has a complaint, it cannot be introduced into the legislature, even though they have the positive right to have that introduced and heard by us. Therefore, I most uh, urgently request that you support House Bill 1543, which simply does two things. It adds to the law and legislative services that they have the authority to draft petitions for the redress of grievances, and it creates a due process for those who are the receiving party of the redress. A petition for redress. And with that, I'll, um, I'll add one more thing at, just at this moment. If you ever questioned whether or not this was an actual practice right before the people, despite the evidence in the House Journal, uh, uh, Elizabeth McClary's uh, petition that will be in your record, we also have uh, Art, part 2, Article 7, which was introduced in uh, 1792, or, or adopted in 1792. And Part 2, Article 7 says, no member of the general court shall take fees, be of counsel, or act as advocate in any case, in any cause before either branch of the legislature. The reason that was introduced was because legislators were taking a fee or taking fees for introducing petitions for the redress of grievance. That is, yes, I'll introduce it if you give me, I don't know, what was appropriate, $10, $5, whatever it was. But it was considered by the people to be wrong, and therefore we amended the Constitution so that, when so that legislators could not take a fee for introducing petitions for the redress of grievance. And with that, I'll take some questions for Representative Sorbonne. Representative Sorbonne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Urban, it's a, how, how does a redress of grievance differ from uh, just uh, filing a, uh, a suit in the courts? Uh, well, it, it differs significantly uh, in the area of jurisdiction. If you look again at our Constitution, <coughs> uh, Part 1, Article 14, and 14 through 19, uh, by inference, give jurisdiction over criminal trials to the judiciary. And Article 20, by inference, uh, clearly gives jurisdiction of uh, civil controversies between two persons to the, to the judiciary. However, Part 1, Articles 31 and 32 explicitly, not by inference, but explicitly give jurisdiction of grievances against the government, or grievances by the government against the people, to the general court, and that's us. Uh, if you wanted uh, kind of a, a mechanistic issue, uh, it means that a person does not have to pay or hire a lawyer to have their grievance against the government, the grievances they suffer heard by the government. It means that the people as a body who are the, since they ratify the Constitution and it's all its amendments and are the rightful arbiters of the Constitution, it means that their grievances are heard by the body, their grievances against the government, are heard by the body over which they have control. Any further questions for Representative Vincent? Representative Sora, follow up. It's, it's been, as you know, my particular uh, crusade since I've been in the legislature to try to convince uh, fellow legislators that the courts, as a coordinate branch of government, have no authority to tell us what to do, to find that we've done things wrong and order us to do anything. And I'm asking you whether, in your estimation, this provision of the Constitution was meant to deal with just those kinds of issues. It wasn't meant to be dealt with through the judiciary, but it was meant to be dealt with directly through the legislature to redress wrongs that we have done in the legislature. Um, that would be a partial answer. Yes, that is one of the intents. It, but it was, it was also used to give redress for all kinds of wrongs. If a, um, an official in town had uh, refused to uh, accept an application for something. Uh, a a uh, zoning board refused to receive an application for new construction. Or uh, uh, a building inspector refused to uh, receive a uh, uh, design for a new structure. Or um, A member, uh, uh, say, uh, what, what we hear in our committee, uh, somebody from DCYF uh, wrongfully taking children out of the home or not, or not following due process that is provided for in our laws. Um, or, uh, in fact, a, a member of the judiciary not uh, denying somebody due process. Those are all grievances against the government, and those are the types of things that this was used to address. It is it, it, so that we can, as the legislature, as the general court, can craft a solution or even make reparations if necessary. Further question? Further question? Thank you. Okay. Uh, in your view, because many of these things are handled now through the judicial rights, in your view, can the legislature uh, constitutionally uh, delegate? inquiries into these kinds of issues concerning lesser uh, you know, sub subordinate governmental entities to be resolved in the judicial branch rather than here through the uh, redress of grievances process? I guess I would have to say that would be up to the people and their understanding of Articles 31 and 32. If we did that and they didn't agree with it, then they could vote us all out of office and voting people who would give them uh, uh, direct access in all cases. 
if they agreed with that solution, then they would vote us in again. And that, again, remembering uh, uh, Part 1, Article 8, that we are their agents and substitutes, we serve at their pleasure, and all power comes from them. I mean, that's the way our government's organized. So is it, is it within our, our power to delegate? I personally don't agree with that, but I, I, I think that, practically speaking, we could, and, and whether or not that was considered lawful would be up to the people. Any further questions for Representative Espio? Mr. Chairman, um, this would require some administration, would it not, having to um, sift through all of the petitions that, would, that could be filed with the legislature and someone would have to make decisions about which ones were worthy, which ones might not be. And, um, and then the other, let me finish, yeah. maybe you can answer it all in one yeah. bunch. Uh, the other question I guess is, you mentioned reparations, so uh, are we talking about unfunded mandates to... Uh, Okay, first question. Um, I don't see that the administration would be any different than the administration of bills. It wasn't originally. It was introduced. The speaker assigned it to a subcommittee. The subcommittee decided whether it was uh, viable. I mean, they might look at it and say, this is ridiculous, and, and recommend that the general court do nothing with it. Or they might look at it and say, we recommend uh, this law be made. and and put that before the general court. Um, as well, It would also be a matter of law. But reparations, no. That would be uh, done at, out of, at the state level, I would I mean, I, I can't imagine us ordering uh, an individual or a, uh, well, an individual or a town to do something. Remember, towns are political subdivisions of the state. And also that in essence, all employees of the towns are in, are acting in the name of the state. So it would be our responsibility to deal with. Any further questions of Representative? So, yes. Representative? Rep, I'm sorry, Representative Roy. I beg your pardon. Um, certainly in part one of the article, Redress. Mm -hmm. uh, are you certain? And we have accepted this concept in terms of impeachment and bills of address. Are you certain that the word redress in that section does not mean impeachment and bills of address? But further. Absolutely, uh, if only by going from the historical record. We know what they did for the first uh, 35 years of our state, and how they received such petitions, and what the types of petitions they received. And uh, it's not unprecedented, as uh, it is also it's the current practice of the British Parliament to act in such cases. And the wording in our Constitution is very reflective of the wording in the uh, English Bill of Rights. Uh, our purpose and role. So, for the last 200 years, been, we've been functioning on bills other than impeachment and bills of address that set public policy vis a vis laws affecting the total population. But the address part, in your mind, it would be pursued with a committee and legislature, but the end result will only affect possibly two people. That is correct. That is that is that was the practice when it, when the Constitution was written. That was what those who wrote the Constitution and ratified the Constitution and practiced it. That's what they believed. Thank you. Uh, Representative Potter, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, I had always imagined that. Uh, this committee or your own um, function as um, 
arms of the total legislature to hear uh, various kinds of uh, concerns. Some of them are grievances, some of them are ways to make things better, whatever. And I'm wondering what you find unsatisfactory about the prison system that would require um, the change that you propose. The plain statement is that, um, let's say, well, taking a, a case out of the newspaper, Judge Coffey, who was determined by the, uh, well, I won't go there. We had a we had a bill of address last year against last session last term last term against a judge alleged that uh, woman, she fell asleep during a hearing and it was based upon the incidents of uh, the experience of one individual and it became a question as to did we believe that was what really happened um, you know and, and eventually the legislature chose not to pursue a bill of address but imagine if you had a judge who was frequently falling asleep in their courtroom and we were repeatedly hearing the grievance from individuals and remember, it now becomes an easier thing to do to get to come in. Just their grievance is that the judge fell asleep in their hearing. We don't have to consider a bill of address based upon a single instance. It allows us to, to build a history, build an experience that some pattern is developed, that there is in fact a pattern, and that, that, that an issue needs to be uh, addressed by the legislature. We are, and I think rightly so, we are loath to remove a judge from their office for a single instance. But if we were to be hearing of a pattern of abuses by a judge, by a police officer, by a member of the ECYF, I mean, the, the list is, is practically endless, um, we would be far more disposed to taking action if, if, if we were aware of, a, of an existing ongoing pattern. Similarly, I mean, there's, there's laws, RSA 16, uh, 643 colon 1, official oppression. It, allowed, it provides for the removal of any official, as defined in the statute, for acting under the color of law, that's doing something that they pretend to be law, or failing to do that, which is reasonably expected of their office. And it's a misdemeanor. If, we, if, if somebody came to us with a, um, uh, a grievance that they had been abused in such a manner, our action might be to order the attorney general or, or county attorney to prosecute that individual under RSA 643 colon 1. That might be our. That might be the result of our hearing, and then we would give an order to the appropriate authority, and 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 the person would receive uh, redress for their grievance. But we don't. We don't see things like that because we have broken the mechanism. Representative Potter. Follow up. Thank you. I can have a follow up. Uh, if a particular issue, let's say um, a CBA uh, grievance, involves only uh, myself, mm -hmm. uh, I can always make an appeal. Um, there, there is a group, the court, to which I can make an appeal. If, however, I decide that the concern is of more general uh, nature, such as a judge repeatedly falling asleep, I find myself quite satisfied, satisfied with the uh, research and, and uh, uh, knowledgeability of the ju Judicial Conduct Committee. And I, I guess I'm not clear what it is about the 
these um, resources that I would have that are unsatisfactory to you? Well, um, first, my first response is I know that there are many people who are not satisfied with the Judicial Conduct Committee. That their experience is that it is a method for uh, overlooking infractions. But beyond that, and uh, just go back to my original statement is, the judiciary does not have lawful jurisdiction. We have lawful jurisdiction. We didn't create the Judicial Conduct Committee. The judiciary did. We created a legislative Judicial Conduct Committee in 2000 and and the judiciary determined it unconstitutional in 2005. Quick comment. Representative, uh, I have not a comment, but if it's a question, uh, would, would you believe that the two committees existed side by side for a period of time? Yes, I know they did. And then the, the, the judiciary disbanded the legislative committee. Thank you, Planning Representative Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a very simple example to see if I understand how this would work. Uh, let's say I've applied for a building permit. I've done everything that's, that's required by the ordinance, and yet nevertheless, the uh, selectmen, because I guess they don't like any building going on, they stay denied. That's one instance. Now, so I go to court under RSA 491, I think it's section seven, which provides for the Superior Court to have jurisdiction for writs of mandamus, which that would be, I want the court to order them to give me the building permit. That, are you saying that's okay, that's that's within the court's purview, but if there were a repeated pattern where there, where the selectmen are just time after time are denying building permits, that's just an appropriate subject for the petition for a redress of grievance here. I don't know that simply denying building permits would be, um, necessarily good grounds for petition of redress of grievance. Because they may have good justification. But, but I'm assuming for the purpose of my question, I'm assuming they don't. It's just But yes, it, that would that would be a, a topic for redress of grievance. But even more importantly, I mean I know of instances where uh, the appropriate authorities simply refuse to receive an application. That would be excellent grounds for petition of redress of grievance. It's not that they yeah, that you got in and, and and for whatever reason the governing body decided it wasn't you know it wasn't acceptable. It's that they wouldn't even <laughs> consider it. Uh, I mean that's that's a, a denial of due process. Mm -hmm. well, well, so do you agree though with the first part of my question, which is that a single instance is an appropriate subject for judicial determination under? I think so. Under the mandamus process, which I I don't have the statute in front of me to check its history, but I imagine that's almost as old as, as the state of New Hampshire itself. Um, Maybe older. I get. I guess it could be. I also think it also, in parallel, could be uh, grounds for redress of grievance. I, I think the person would have good grounds to go either direction. I mean, certainly we provided for it in law. But I don't see under the rules of the Constitution that we have any grounds ourselves not to receive it. We might receive it and in, in short order say, this is ridiculous. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Howard Wilson. research as Representative Pitsy has done. I have looked at various actions as redress of grievance deemed through some of the stuff over in the state library. And most of them were, at that point in time, a little more mundane than we have otherwise or would be needful now 
given the multiplicity of government agencies in particular that we have endowed unto ourselves over the last 200 plus years. I should let you know that the Bill of Rights, Article 1, also has in its language redress of grievance. The federal government, both Congress, Senate, and President, have said we will not honor this redress of grievance, even though it exists on paper and not much practice over the last 200 years. And at least one organization brought suit to enforce that argument by which they are being stonewalled by the federal court systems. I think something of this nature needs exist in this state such that individuals who are aggrieved of government and find the courts less than <coughs> interested at best, or the courts themselves being the harm-ing body, require that we come before this legislature or a committee of this legislature with a grievance of our own, individually. And the action or reaction, depending on how it may be done, need not be as monetary response. It may need only be that the individual need be chastised mightily, possibly removed from office, that's entirely up to the hearing committee dealing with a petition for redress of grievance. I think if you will do a little more research to back up what Representative Itzi provided you, you will find page after page after page of individuals who believed at that point in time that they were aggrieved of government for one reason or another and in most cases received some sort of reparation, whether that was as cash, return of property, removal from somebody else of office, or I'm not really sure. But I think you need to do a little bit more research on this, but I think it is well worth finding this legislation as off the pass. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for Mr. Wilson? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Back to work. Chair recognizes Mr. Dwayne Bessel. I hope I pronounced your name yes. correctly. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Dwayne Bessel. I'm from uh, Derry, East Derry, New Hampshire formerly of uh, Legendary New Hampshire. First, I'd like to rep uh, thank Representative uh, Cody and this August body for hearing me out. When I first heard about this through a friend of mine, uh, I, I couldn't believe my excitement. I have been myself personally immersed in one of these situations where I have been uh, kicked around by the town of Londonderry and uh, regarding my use of my property and have subsequently uh, by the courts been uh, removed from my property and at one time I was barred from even stepping foot on it. Uh, what happened to me I think has probably happened to many people that they have been in a situation where they've been uh, trying to redress the wrongs against them in front of the courts and the courts for whatever reason have decided that uh, even though it is their job to give you a fair hearing and uh, hear both sides of the picture have been uh, perhaps more mindful of the interest of the town over the individual uh, uh, people who live in the town. Uh, regarding uh, um, Representative Sorg of uh, the writ of mandamus, I tried that writ of mandamus in my case and uh, to force the town of Londonderry to 
follow its own rules, and the court uh, refused to uh, support uh, my uh, motion, and in which case I was, uh, you know, forced from my property uh, uh, as a disabled veteran. That was a really tough thing for me to do. I was uh, sub subsequently uh, living in my van in the uh, Walmart parking lot and have only recently been restored to uh, the use of my property. Uh, and all of this was, was caused by a town who was intent on hide, hiding a secret that they had, uh, they had built all these soccer fields for, their, uh, for the people of town and couldn't, uh, couldn't tell while they were building those soccer fields where they were going to get the water from. I was blocked from building on my property of the home that I wanted to build. I bought 80 acres of land, deeded from the 1880s. When I went to the city, they said, well, there's no way we can keep you from building a house there. And yet they were able to keep me from building a house there because they said they were interested in protecting the wetlands. And as it turned out, the, the very source of the water for the soccer fields turned out to be the stream that was the wetlands. So I went to Concord several times to research this matter and it turns out that the town had built these soccer fields, approved these soccer fields without even designating a source of water. And so what happened was, in my case, even though I was being pursued by the town for uh, not having an electrical permit and, and not having a, a, a uh, town approved septic system, uh, both of which weren't the case, the, uh, the town uh, had a much higher interest that they were trying to protect. And they got the, the courts to act as their surrogates and, uh, and wound up uh, taking advantage of me. And I, I, for one, was excited about the fact that I might have the possibility of be, being able to come before this body and have my case uh, redressed uh, without the, the somebody grinding down into the minutiae of some case and deciding, oh, we're going to not hear your, your uh, matter because, well, you didn't file it on the right day or you didn't quote the right law. Or I'm hoping you guys would be in a position to look at a much bigger picture and see that, gee, here's somebody who really has been hurt, whose rights have been trampled on, and uh, we can set this matter straight. And I, I, I appreciate your time, and I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Are there any questions for Mr. Bethel? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Chair recognizes Mr. Joseph Haas. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm My name is Joe Haas. I live in Gilmerton now. And I submitted a two page uh, papers to you. One was my email photocopy and the other one was a posting they have on the website. Hopefully it's in your file. I don't know if any of you have been received it. But it's just still in the file. It's here to just answer any questions. But I can uh, make a few comments too if I could. On uh, the write-up that uh, the representative sponsor was talking about, uh, that's a good idea. But as it exists now, I have filed numerous petitions, or tried to, with the House clerks to get over to the House Speaker. Because uh, the House Speaker, by rule number four, must send it over to the appropriate committee. And I remember one representative over here, he was saying, well, who's going to uh, uh, filter these, or uh, forget the actual word you use, sift. Nobody sifts these things. If they're filed and they're sent over to the House Speaker, and it's his or her, her duty to send them over to the appropriate committee. Now, the first one that I ever filed was with uh, Roland Heeman, and he put his seat number down instead of his district number, because by House Rule number 36, you got to, they're endorsed. They're not written up by the uh, legislative services. The person that uh, wants it filed uh, signs it, <coughs> and the, the House representative endorses it. And I did finally, after taking Gene Chandler to the Ethics Committee, he did say, well, you, 
you, your friendly rep, uh, Norma Heeman, put a seat number down. So then I put a district number down, and then I sent it back uh, to the House clerk to give to the House Speaker. And uh, then I had the three reps, the se second time, the third Excuse time. Excuse me, Mr. House, would you just address the bill, please? Directly. Well, what I'm getting at is there's already a, a system in the works, and uh, this is a good bill because it sets up a statutory mandate of what has to be done. Right now, the House Speaker is a tyrant. She's a tyrant, he was a tyrant, and none of these petitions went anywhere. So you need something to beef it up to send it over to the appropriate committee. And, and for uh, what uh, Greg Sorg said, on uh, a few things. I would just like to say that uh, uh, one example of mine is I found a court case that says when the judge changes the position of the parties in a preliminary injunction, it makes the court a party to extortion. Now what does that mean? That means the court is a thief. Now where are you going to go for your uh, uh, remedy? You're going to this body. I was a landlord and turned into a tenant before I even had my day in court. And when I had my day in court, it wasn't even a jury trial by Article 20. It's going to hit your Constitution. Very, very asinine and ridiculous thing. Judicial system. So I, I need this in the body to put this on the book so I can get some justice. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Haas from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Chair recognizes Mr. David Johnson. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. I'm David Johnson of London, New Hampshire. And before I get started, I just wanted to report to this committee that today my petition for redress of grievance is being submitted to my representative, Al Baldessaro, and Daniel Itza, Representative Itza. The problem is I can't get my petition to the House of Legislature because the mechanism by which it is implemented has been deleted. So therefore, my rights are suspended, and I can't get what I need done. And just to clarify something, it does say here in Article 31, the legislature shall assemble for the redress of public grievances and for making such laws as the public may require. And in Article 10, I'm just touching on this just to demonstrate the seriousness of the intent of the writing of this bill. It says, that the government being instituted for common benefit, protection, and security of the whole community, and not for the private interest or emolument of the born man, family, or class of men, therefore, wherever the ends of government are perverted, and the public liberty manifestly endangered, and all other means of redress are ineffectual, the public may end of right ought to reform the old and establish a new government. The doctrine of non resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive of the and happiness of mankind. That's, that's entitled right of revolution. I'm not talking about revolution. I'm talking about the seriousness of the intent. The gentleman that just spoke before I was talking about something that I have to touch on, which is the courts are not the avenue to get problems resolved. The courts have an agenda. One of them is Title IV D reimbursement dollars from the federal government. There is no incentive to take people off the child support plan. Excuse Even me, in a fifty foot. If you would just address the bill, please. That's exactly what I'm doing. I have gone to the courts, I have gone to the Judicial Conduct Committee. There is no Judicial Conduct Committee in this state. It is a committee to protect the judges. My daughter has been harmed, and I have been harmed, due to lack of due process, absolute brazen disregard for the law, the Constitution, public policy, and Supreme Court of the United States rulings. Without due process, without due process, and against the child support guidelines of the state of New Hampshire and the federal government, which, by the way, we're purposely many years behind the child support guidelines. Mr. Government. Johnson, I'm addressing the that. child support guidelines are not before the community. I'm, well, that's what I'm touching on. So what happened was, with me having 65% of the custody of my child and the same income, according to the writing of the marital master, I was jailed for non-payment of child support to the mother for 10 weeks, robbing my daughter for the first time with her father. Then, when my daughter described the grief and agony to my lawyer, who she has a personal relationship with, 
I had custody taken away from me from the marital master because I dared report him to the judicial conduct committee. The marital master program is so far into corruption for Title IV D. Mr. Jones, well, would you please address the bill. The bill right? means I need my ability to redress grievance with the House of Legislature. The court is not an avenue. The court is corrupt. The court won't even hear it in the Judicial Supreme Court because it's such an embarrassment. You got to see the ridiculous uh, documentation they provide to try to cover up what they do. The bill for redress of grievance is necessary. It's a must. It's my right. And I expect to have it. And it is also unlawful to vote against it. We all in here took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state of New Hampshire. To vote against it would immediately, it would immediately say a very powerful statement. You're not here to uphold the Constitution. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I'm not even saying that anybody here is going to vote against it. But to do this, what's going wrong? My poor daughter is suffering from the stuff and the health problems caused by the court in the family division. And they have absolutely no regard. I constantly get reports from the Judicial Conduct Committee that, well, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing that can be done. Many, many, many laws have been broken. Now my daughter's living on nitrofuridantin every day because she's no longer able to treat her medical problems because of the neglect of the court. I need to be heard in the House of Legislature for the petition for redress of grievance that I'm submitting to my representatives, and I expect to be heard. I'm sorry, but I've been wronged terribly by the family court. The Chief Justice Broderick purposely ignored two-thirds of the complaints that the, that the special committee discovered, which were about the family court. I, we have no other way to do it. We have no way of dealing with the judicial branch. We don't elect them. At least if I come to my House of Representatives, they might be able to get my daughter out of the fire that she's in. Now I have another contempt hearing coming up because I sought appropriate medical care for my daughter. And next month, in a month, I have to go back to court and probably go back to jail because I'm not paying someone child support and I'm getting appropriate medical care for my daughter. Now, I need this to stop. And I'm not, but the tone of my voice is confusing. I want you to know that I'm not angry. I'm scared and I'm very sad. My little girl is suffering tremendously. There is no recourse with the judicial branch of the government. They are running amok. I'm begging this court and this committee to grant this wish and enact the bill for redress of grievance and vote for it. It's a must. It had to, this will be all resolved quickly if these same, the same marital master I know personally has three serious, serious offenses. That he's committed on different judges. Judges. You and I have had several conversations about your personal situation. And you agreed. It's not. Um, and you agreed. But really Senate Bill 401 is co sponsored by you, and it empowers the marital masters to have signature authority, which is a direct violation. We're not going to discuss that. No, I know, but that, that's why there's no place for us to go. Are that's what any, necessitates the bill. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. For members of the committee. Seeing none, thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Tom Sutcliffe. I'd ask all witnesses mm -hmm. to please address the bill directly. The bill is yes. really the only thing before the committee. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I'm here to say that I'm 100% behind this bill. It's a bill that really is probably, without a doubt, one of the most important bills that we would now get back into where it belongs. The founding fathers that wrote the Constitution and everything felt it was strong enough to put in at one time. That, then it got acquiesced or usurped by the court system, which at that time consisted of good men trying to do the right thing. The citizen then brought his problems to the courts. They felt the courts did a very good job at that time. Now, as I'm sure everybody here is aware, the courts in New Hampshire are broken. They are very badly broken. The people are more frustrated than they've ever been in, I guess, the 200 plus years of this, this great union. They don't have a place to go if they can't go to their own court system. And we do have problems there. Let me tell you, there are massive problems there. 
nothing seems to be done about it, except for what I guess is going on today in the Supreme Court. Now, I have a simple little thing here. This involves the New Hampshire Constitution. This is a court, a court, uh, this is a court case I filed. It involves the, the New Hampshire Constitution and the federal Constitution. Very simple. I said to my town, you're violating these laws. I said, you are spending people's money to advocate a position on a particular ballot uh, or, or vote before the public. Real simple. Well, it's been to two courts that couldn't quite understand what was going on. And because it was brought pro se, that meant that they're not going to respect your rights. And so they manipulate that as well as they possibly can. Now it's in the federal court system. $15,000 later, the law is on the books. It would have been very simple to come before a group like this and say, here's the laws, here's what they're doing wrong, please decide. $15,000, three years later, on a case that was before the voters, and it was using public monies to influence the outcome of that vote. Real simple, real cut and dry. I would have loved to have gone to the legislature and, and had a redress of grievances and had them hear that case. But it had to go through the mill. And it's three years later, it will be heard in May in federal court. But that's what it took for one little citizen to say, would you please uphold my rights? Now, when you pass this bill, and I know you will pass this bill, because it's the only course of action you can give the people of this state. It's the only right thing to do. When you do pass this bill, it's going to be sending a great message to all the local governments. You can't continue to do what you've been doing, which is to sit there and say, if you don't like it, and believe me, this is the attitude prevailing out there, sue us. That's the attitude that we've allowed the local governments to have. If you don't like what we're doing, sue us because they know that they'll be protected by the courts. So by you getting it back to a redress of grievances seems to me to be very commonsensical. The founding fathers in their infinite wisdom also concluded that it was very important for the people to have this. And I know without question that this good committee is going to do that. It's that important to the people of this state. Nothing hurts more than a dagger put to your heart because of injustice. Nothing more that I think anybody could be aware of. Thank you very much for this time thank to be you, heard. Sir, are there any questions for Mr. Sutcliffe from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Can I move this? Uh, please, please do. Please leave a copy with the clerk. Right here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Dennis Goddard. I hope that's correct. Yes. That is, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank the members of the committee. My name is Dennis Goddard. I am here in support of the bill. I will be brief. You may be relieved to know that I don't have any particular grievance to relate to you today. I will speak specifically on the bill just to point out one or two specific items. Thank you. The first is, I think what we're seeing here is standard economics as pent-up consumer demand. And, and my heart does go out to some of these, some of these folks who uh, have sometimes had to go out of their way um, to go through a process that doesn't quite work uh, to come before you. So I do believe that what we're seeing today is an overcorrection for an underserved market, that if things were perhaps more normalized and things re-reached their equilibrium state, I, I think we'll see perhaps a more normal process take place. But one thing I just wanted to point out to you all, there was a bill that came before you that many of you may or may not have noticed. It went on the consent calendar, and it was the most simplest bill, really. It was a House Joint Resolution, uh, and it was concerning the, the United States Department of Agriculture, I believe it was the, the dairy situation, you may or may not have recalled any of the specifics. It had to do with the fact that it turned out that the, the federal government, in calculating some uh, subsidies or amounts that were owed to New Hampshire, basically screwed up in some of the calculations. And so we didn't get the money back that, that we were due as a state. Okay. What did we do? Well, we filed a resolution 
And if you look at the title of the resolution, I believe it was HDR 13, it, it said that it was a petition for redress to the federal government for this wrong that had happened to us as a state. It was unanimous in the committee. They went on the consent calendar where it passed. It was very simple and it wasn't all that contentious and it didn't really take all that much time for the legislature to process what was a pretty standard grievance that the state of New Hampshire had with the general government, the federal government of Washington. Same simple process. It just belongs to the citizens of the state and relating to their state government as much as our state government needs that tool for relating to our federal government. It's a simple matter of allowing people to bring in air of grievance in a way that doesn't have to involve the courts and in all that entails. That we can start by just having an open public dialogue and then go into a court situation if that's necessary for that issue. And that's all I had to share with you at this point. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Are there any questions for Mr. Goddard from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone who has not, to this, to this point, filed a pink card who would wish to testify on this? No? Seeing no one, I would close the public hearing on House Bill 1543. We will be in recess later for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Feeling feisty yet? Want to participate? Have your say? The LOB is waiting.